Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimble Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. This week on the podcast, we feature a few of my many conversations from last week's AWS reInvent conference in Las Vegas. For today's show, I'm excited to present our second annual reInvent Roundtable Roundup. I had a blast last week learning about all the new ML and AI products and services announced by AWS. If you missed the news coming out of reInvent, or you want to know more about what one of the biggest AI platform providers is up to, you'll want to stay tuned because we discussed many of their new offerings in this show. This year, I'm joined by my friends Dave McCrory, VP of Software Engineering at Wise.io at GE Digital, and Val Bercovici, founder and CEO of Pencil Data. We cover all of AWS's most important ML and AI announcements, including SageMaker Ground Truth, Reinforcement Learning in Neo, DeepRacer, Inferentia and Elastic Inference, ML Marketplace Personalized, Forecast, Textract, and more. We don't do these kinds of discussions very often on the show, but I always enjoy it when we do, and I hope you do too. Before we dive in, I'm at NeurIPS this week in Montreal and KubeCon next week in Seattle, and I'd love to connect with any listeners in attendance or in the area. Feel free to shoot me a message via at Sam Charrington on Twitter, via email or the Twimmel AI website, or if you see me, don't be afraid to say hi. If you're heading to NeurIPS, look for the listener meetup and AI platforms meetup topics I've posted in the Whova app. See you around. And now, on to the show. Hey, what's up, everyone? I am here at reInvent, and this is becoming a bit of a tradition, uh, isn't it, Dave? It is indeed. <laughs> and the, the tradition that I will unveil is our second annual reInvent Roundup Roundtable, in which we discuss all of the cool things that happened here at reInvent, all of the announcements, et cetera. Uh, and so before, or, or as kind of our first step in jumping in, I would like the two of you to introduce yourselves. And uh, I guess, Dave, since you're our veteran panelist, uh, why don't you go first? Certainly. My name is Dave McCrory. I am the VP of Engineering for Wise.io, a division of GE Digital that uh, works on machine learning and industrial Internet of Things. Awesome. And Val? Yes, yeah, Sam and Dave, it's uh, my honor to be here on the second roundup, reInvent roundup. My name is Val Burkevici, and it's very wise of you, Sam, to let me pronounce my name first because it always trips up. <laughs> <laughs> always trips up some people. I am CEO and co-founder of Pencil Data, and you know our tagline is "We tamper-proof digital transformation," but that has a, a lot of deeper meanings as well. Before that, some people might remember me on, you know, from your podcast uh, when I was CTO of NetApp and Solid Fire. Yep. And, uh, you know, I was thinking earlier about what is always so cool for me about reInvent is that I get to see so many people that I've known for so long. Were both of you guys also at the first, the very first reInvent? I was not at the first, but I think I've been at every reInvent since. Okay. I think I'm a lot like Dave. I have to check my records. I know I lobbied hard and then I have to be at the first one. I don't remember whether we succeeded the first year or that second year for sure. Okay, nice, nice. I was at the first and second, and I think I missed one or two in between and then have been at the last three, I think there are. I don't, I don't know. I think we do not have enough time to talk about everything that was unveiled uh, and announced here at reInvent. And of course, we'll want to kind of wait our discussion points a little bit to the ML and AI side of things, but um, maybe a good way to start is to just ask each of you, uh, what are you most excited about based on what you heard announced here at reInvent? In my opinion, there, there are um, a couple of things that are really exciting. Uh, I think the Lambda layers function, which, uh, which, really comes down to being able to run uh, different uh, runtimes 
on Lambda is probably the, the biggest and most exciting thing to me. I think that's going to have a profound um, impact on the use of Lambda and the growth of Lambda, but I see it plugging into a lot of uh, the machine learning um, kind of problems that we had that were much harder to use Lambda uh, pre being able to bring your own libraries, dependencies, and execution environments. Uh, I think that's big. I also think it's. Um, I'll think also think it really adds a. I guess another layer of difficulty if you're a platform as a service vendor, uh, not that there weren't already some difficulties in, in some forms or, or others, but I think layers uh, definitely adds to that. And so is layers the ability to act, to support you know, multiple or arbitrary languages for Lambda functions, or is it more than that? It is indeed the ability to to do the runtime. So that would be, say, if you wanted to run uh, Go or Python or Java or uh, pick your pick your favorite language, Rust. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, but then, along with that, being able to have the libraries and, and dependencies that go with that, so that formerly, if you wanted to run a Lambda function, very very basic code that you were essentially just gluing two things together with. Um, you might have something trigger something else, uh, etc. But uh, it was kind of limited from that perspective. Very scalable, but also very limited. With layers, you you end up with so many different abilities that you wouldn't have before, you know, prior with just regular Lambda. And, and I would say uh, that, that makes it incredibly attractive in my mind. You can now do much more complex things, even within the Lambda functions themselves, uh, because of the ability to, um, to do this. What you still cannot do is directly tie it to um, persistence. So there's still no guarantee of persistence. Um, if that makes sense, that's kind of the one missing thing. Uh, other than that, uh, I guess sky's the limit, so to speak. They also added some other functionality, but layers is the most exciting to me. Um, I'd say the other thing, since I mentioned that there was more than one, uh, the <laughs> other thing was the Kafka streaming um, capability. So now, basically, AWS will run Kafka for you. So Amazon managed streaming for Kafka is pretty exciting in my mind, being able to uh, uh, just use Kafka instead of having to set it up, configure it, manage it, and maintain it. Uh, that That's pretty exciting. If I was someone that was running Confluent Kafka on my own and I used AWS, this would really make me pause and, and think about, do I want to keep doing that or would I rather just let Amazon do it? Kafka is... Uh, a big part of a lot of data pipelines. Uh, but I also recently interviewed a woman named Lima Nasri from Comcast on the podcast who built out a data pipeline for a recommendation system using Lambda. Uh, I thought it was really cool uh, that her team was able to take advantage of Lambda functions to do data transformations and things like that. So I think well, that'll be increasingly part of the, you know, the machine learning toolkit and not just the traditional app dev toolkit. That's right. And now she has personalized. So for me, you know, if we take us all the way back to Wednesday, <laughs> yesterday, <of> this week, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm thinking of Andy's keynote. And we were talking about, you know, the very first couple of reinvents where the big announcement was a new instance type or some new lower pricing for EC2 or, or S3, et cetera. And we've come such a long way since then where the major highlights, even though I think there were some pretty cool storage highlights for me, were definitely all the machine learning introductions. Uh, there's so many, but I think my personal favorite is uh, the SageMaker Ground Truth. Mm. That's one of the things I wanted to have when I first got into machine learning, and I just couldn't believe it wasn't there. And I don't know, I mean, you guys might be more current with the Google Suite port or the Google Cloud portfolio than me, but I'm not sure if they have a similar service yet. So it just strikes me as AWS continues to just be more in tune with what their customers really want and they're, they're executing and delivering really well. And so SageMaker Ground Truth is a, a new offering that basically allows users to create these labeling pipelines. Um, exactly. And uh, how do you want to go through the details of that? How, how, yeah. uh, 
Okay. So such such a big part of an average data scientist's work, if there is such a thing as an average data scientist, is essentially <laughs> set, setting up supervised training, right? That's supervised learning. That's effectively what most machine learning is nowadays. And there's a very manual human dependency, ironically, on that on that part, which is to actually label data. So a lot of the you know, captures and recaptures that we see sometimes, or we're asked to identify objects, you know, on a, on a four by four frame of pictures, is us being mechanical Turks and doing labeling for other people to label, label you know, features in an image and so forth. The ability to apply machine learning intelligently and, and use inference to automatically label a huge portion of these data sets now without all that manual effort, I think, is a huge step forward in in the productivity of data scientists and the ability to generate you know, more knowledge models going forward. And it's part of that theme I think Sammy and I discussed yesterday, which is that AWS, ironically better than Google at the moment, is doing a really good job of democratizing AI, democratizing machine learning for people, democratizing the, the data science field itself. And that's that's good for the industry, right? That brings more people into it. It brings more projects forward. It promotes more knowledge models. And I, you know, I've got a selfish motivation as well in that my company helps with the uh, reproducibility of all that once we have more candidates for uh, promotion into production. The thing that I found most interesting about Ground Truth is that it's the labeling, uh, you know, it kind of ties into these third-party labeling services. So Mechanical Turk is one example, but they, uh, I think they announced like seven different partners, including Figure 8. Um, yeah. But it's not just that there's a pipeline that includes active learning. So they are optimizing uh, what needs to be labeled. Basically, they're, they're, they're going to choose what needs to be manually labeled according to some optimization function as opposed to randomly. Uh, the idea being that you kind of manage and keep low the costs of the labeling process. That is pretty cool. Yeah, that's by far the exciting part to me. You know, the, the fact that there's better integration with the Mechanical Turks is is, a, is an important sort of workflow improvement. But the fact that we're finally being able to sort of you know go uh, go native, if you will, or eat our own dog food and actually automate the function of of labeling by and large is you know even if it's not a complete solution today, the fact that that's the goal and the fact that we have an initial offering is very exciting to me. So Val, I've got to say you surprised me here, given what your company's focused on nowadays. I'd have thought that your favorite announcement was uh, one of a couple of others. Well, there's definitely on the blockchain <laughs> side, there was, there was the expected, right? So uh, AWS is kind of playing catch up to IBM and Oracle with regards to offering managed hyperledger blockchains, but also having the nice option of managed Ethereum blockchain, which I thought was super cool. The wildcard, which I think has got a lot of people buzzing, definitely myself included, is QLDB. The I'm not sure why they named it Quantum Ledger, but certainly the, the Quantum Ledger database is, is super exciting. And it actually corresponds to talks I've been giving at O'Reilly this year around how this very famous blog in the, uh, just before the peak of the, the cryptocurrency mania called the Fat Protocol blog which argued that there'd be a lot of network effect value in a protocol more than the apps. And that was before there were 2,000 versions of Ethereum, so <laughs> 2,000 potential network effects. So the, the FAT protocol blog was brilliant you know, in 2016, but did not stand the test of time. And at least the enterprise reality is very much that you know there will be a few key platforms, blockchain and secure ledger platforms, such as QLDB, that enterprise is standardized, standardized on, but there won't be 2,000 of them. And that the the network effect will indeed go to the platform and the application layers where the value is closer to the user. Mm. Well, it's my understanding that the quantum and QLDB comes from the name of the internal AWS system that they kind of extracted this from, whether you know in code or in idea. That makes sense. What's what's so exciting about that relative to you know the managed blockchain that you know folks kind of expected them to to come out with. So what most people don't realize when you're talking about a managed blockchain service is it addresses two of the three impediments towards adoption in the enterprise. That first one being sort of the design and creation or building of a blockchain. And the second one, which is very important after that, the ongoing operations and management of that blockchain. 
But the third one that, you know, the actual buyers or, or you know, budget owners of these technologies, the executives that would want to see results uh, that isn't addressed by this or any other managed blockchain service is the usability of the blockchain. It's actually tying it into your applications. It's actually seeing a either, you know, operational efficiencies or greater compliance or ideally even, you know, new business models that were impossible before. And that's the part that, you know, wasn't announced really by a managed blockchain service. But they inched a lot closer with QLDB, where now you've got you know, a fully ready-made solution to just consume. It's not about thinking how you would build QLDB or how you'd manage it. Obviously, AWS is, is, is great at a president doing that for you. It's ready for consumption. So that's what excited me very, very much about QLDB. And it certainly just is another instantiation of a um, soon-to-be popular service that validates the market that Pencil Data is in. Right, right, right. So for me... And, and I guess I'm sure you guys felt like this as well. It's, it's kind of like a kid in a candy store. So many cool new things. It's really hard to pick just one. But if You're I right. really, really had to pick just one, the thing that I'm super excited about is the SageMaker reinforcement learning announcement. Uh, and <clears throat> I've been a fan of and talking about and learning about reinforcement learning for a bit now. Folks on the podcast have heard a lot of conversations about that. But what is always part of those conversations is how hard it is and how, you know, unstable the uh, the algorithm training process is, how difficult it is to get the right reward function, all of these things, uh, and how hard it is to ultimately apply it in a, a real enterprise environment. And uh, we've seen folks take swipes at making that easier. Bonsai uh, has been a sponsor of this uh, podcast the, in our industrial AI series last year. And uh, they were acquired by Microsoft because they did such a great job at this. But AWS has such a massive presence in the, the marketplace. There's a real opportunity for them to bring a lot of attention to reinforcement learning and as a result kind of start this virtuous cycle of you know more eyes on it you know lower the impediments to doing it and uh, make it much more easy to extract value out of it so I'm super excited about that it's uh, an extension to SageMaker which is their kind of data science as a service platform it supports a wide variety of 2D and 3D simulation and physics environments, including OpenGym and Sumerian, which is their 3D environment, uh, RoboMaker, which is another one of their announcements, uh, Roz, which is the robotics operating system. It's got a lot of the pieces in place. You know, the one thing that's kind of interesting about this relative to AWS's typical MO, they, they tend to be... You know, this is a lot further out in front, I think, than they tend to like to be, right? They're, they t they yeah. kind of pride themselves on being very responsive and only building stuff when like real customers are uh, asking for it and oftentimes commoditizing something that already exists, right? Like S3, we knew what storage was. They didn't invent that. Uh, EC2, they, you know, made servers more accessible, Um yeah, they're not inventing reinforcement learning either. So I don't know that this analogy, you know, fits very well, but it's certainly, we're certainly way out ahead of the market in some ways. And hopefully, you know, what I'm excited about is just accelerating that process because the challenge with deep learning is that it's so data intensive, labeled data intensive and reinforcement learning plus simulation uh, promises to fix that for a good many applications. And this is a qu question I'd have for you, Sam, is, you know, empirically, I'm seeing a ton of just, you know, image recognition, text and voice recognition, and the related neural networks that, that correspond with that. I haven't seen a lot of successful production, you know, transfer learning or reinforcement learning projects in place. You know, do you think that would kickstart that and would, would open up a new front, new frontier, actually, in the whole machine learning world? Uh, so I would say, you know, I would kind of pick apart transfer and reinforcement learning. I think transfer learning is one of those things that people maybe don't talk about as much. It's kind of receded into the background, but it is, I think, foundational to a lot of what folks are doing in the image domain. Like it's very popular to 
pick up a pre-trained ImageNet model and if not use that out of the gate, like tweak that, use, you know, or fine tune it, they'll say, um, and kind of start with that to avoid having to train everything from scratch. Uh, and in fact, there's a lot of work that's been uh, done recently by Jeremy Howard and Sebastian Ruder, who have both been on the podcast relatively recently to apply that same transfer learning concept to uh, natural language processing. Uh, but reinforcement learning, on the other hand, like it's still largely the domain of, of like playing video games. It's like the, the thing that research labs are pursuing as a stepping stone to uh, general artificial intelligence. Uh, the only folks that very, few, I've seen very few folks applying deep reinforcement learning in a kind of commercial enterprise businessy kind of way, the bonsai again being the, the, the one. Are, are you talking about, so you changed it to deep reinforcement learning versus reinforcement learning. And we also touched on the idea of, uh, of transfer. I tried to be careful there because yes, reinforcement learning does have a history that goes back to, I don't know when, I think the sixties, like it's been around for a while and it's been used as a kind of standard optimization algorithm. I think it's related to like multi-arm bandits and things like that. I don't know a ton about it and how it's been used, but what's different is deep reinforcement learning. It's promise, but also the challenges associated with making it work. Got it. Yeah, I've seen a lot of, you know, Elon Musk headlines around how open AI is beating all sorts of, you know, professional esports gamers and stuff like that. But to your point, I haven't seen a lot of commercial applications of it yet. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 if Amazon scale says anything, maybe, you know, we'll we'll see that change over the next couple of years. I did want to hit on um on something interesting since we were talking about uh different things that we believed uh were the most significant. Um, I've been, uh, I've been kind of perusing and I know I had mentioned, uh, as my favorite and, and most impactful being the, uh, Lambda layers functionality. Um, but I did kind of a, uh, interesting perusal on Twitter and it appears that the most popular announced thing, um, out there is the outpost, uh, announcement mm, yeah. out of all of them. And by by a fairly large margin, like uh, three three ish uh, x roughly compared to everything else. Uh, well, actually, that's not true. Looking the uh, the run times to lambda is about um, let's say uh, two thirds uh, as popular as the outpost announcement. Although taking into account it was announced six hours ago, maybe it'll surpass it. But outpost is pretty darn popular. Um, and I think it is pretty significant, both for ML and such, um, and outside of ML, really. Um, the other announcement that we didn't talk about that I do think has big impact for ML is the, and I don't remember the name of it now, but it's the elastic something that you can attach a GPU uh, to an EC2 instance. I see that as pretty big as well. So uh, let, let's start there and then kind of work our way back to... To outpost, uh, I was in a conversation with someone yesterday. Maybe it was it was you, Val, when we were talking about what was kind of you know what was our most exciting, what were the things we were most exciting about. And in that conversation, I prefaced it by, you know, there's a thing I'm kind of geeked about, kid in a candy store style, and the thing I think is going to be most impactful, uh, and that thing is the elastic inference. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Andy, Jesse, I, I heard a couple of numbers thrown around. And in fact, this was a question that I was asking folks to share data points on on Twitter several weeks ago. But the, the data points that AWS folks were throwing around were that anywhere from 10 to 20 percent, 10 to 30 percent of the cost of doing machine learning is training. Uh, and 70 to 90 percent of the cost uh, is inference. And the example that, uh, that someone pointed me to when I was first looking for this that, um, really hit home for me was, uh, was Google 
And it turns out that their investment in the TPU building chips um, and, and as much as they're investing in, in that uh, now on, you know, multiple versions of these chips, you know, that all started when Jeff Dean kind of did this back of the envelope calculation that said that, you know, if uh, our user base does just three seconds of voice search per day, the inference would basically eat us alive and, you know, have us needing to build, you know, some multiple of the or them needing to build some multiple of the number of data centers that they mm. already had. Uh, and so yeah. attacking that inference costs uh, and, and AWS is throwing down numbers like 75% reductions in inference costs uh, is potentially quite huge for folks that are doing uh, ML in the cloud. Yeah, my, my, my question, actually a curiosity more than a question is, I always have this mental model of training being done in the cloud, but inference at the edge. And a bunch of the use cases for customers we're working with, like autonomous vehicles, driverless taxis, and so forth, are very much that. But do you have any idea of what the percentage is of inference, if there is a breakdown roughly between cloud and edge? Uh, that is a good question. I don't have any data. I think what everyone's excited about uh, for edge is that uh, you know, even if the whatever the number is today, there's kind of you know whenever you see like somebody joked about it on did Andy Jassy joke about this on on stage or maybe it was at the analyst summit, but like you always see this exponential curve in the number of devices that are going to be out in the edge, and there is a presumption that a lot of inference is going to be moving uh, to the edge for you know latency and bandwidth reasons and all other things. In fact, they had an announcement there, I think. Yeah, actually, so it's SageMaker Neo. Did uh, I don't think it showed up in the keynote. Did you guys catch that one? I did not. I did not see it in the keynote. I, did, I don't remember seeing it anywhere. Uh, so SageMaker Neo is a essentially it's it's a they're open sourcing it. It's an open source model compiler. And so they kind of pitching it as this train once run anywhere, uh, but they've built in some some deep optimization into this model compiler so that uh, they're touting 2x performance and one-tenth the size for your models. And they're targeting a wide variety of... Uh, of hardware targets, including edge devices and some of these like uh, compute and memory constrained uh, device targets. That one should be pretty cool. And yeah, it kind of begs the question to Dave's point, you know, how low or how far can they take outpost in future generations? Can they bring it down to, you know, Raspberry Pi style and maybe not the elasticity, but still have the exact same control and manage and flow that you'd enjoy in a cloud? Mm, so I never thought of Outpost quite like that. So maybe we should jump into Outpost and what it is and why are folks excited about it? I think that's a good idea. I think it's going to be the bridge that gets people that um, that had reasons why they needed physical equipment on premises. Um, this doesn't give them the excuse that Amazon is only um, available in Amazon data centers. Um, you now have flexibility to have equipment running uh, on premises uh, that that is the same as what AWS runs in its data centers. Well, um, to you, uh, all um, all on site, as well as offering the capability to run VM either in the cloud or on site. I I see that as a pretty big deal. It, it it really is. And, you know, here's a couple of the maybe non-intuitive questions that come to mind for me is how are Amazon and partners like VMware going to prove compliance, you know, with data domesticity laws or other privacy laws internationally with regards to what kind of metadata and what kind of control, you know, really flows back and forth between one of their regions and, and an on-prem implementation of Outpost. I'd love to get more details on that. Well, one of the things that was not in abundance around this announcement was details. <laughs> <laughs> what we know is that this is AWS designed hardware. It's uh, the same hardware 
they say that runs in their data centers, but it's delivered and installed uh, on the customer premises. There's supposedly two flavors of it. There's, uh, well, there are two flavors of it. There, what, what's not clear at all are the hardware specs. And they said they're not talking about that until next year. Uh, there are two uh, kind of flavors of it. One of them is, you know, runs this VMware uh, kind of flavor of, of AWS. And the other is kind of traditional EC2 instances. And so it appears like uh, an extension of your AWS availability zone. That begs my questions. You know, yeah, I would want exactly. it to be like, as a, as a developer, as an operator, I'd want it to operate like that. But, you know, when I think about overseas deployments or even things like China, there's a lot of those detailed questions that need to be answered to see just how broadly applicable this could be. You know, this is not new in the kind of the world of, of cloud. Uh, Microsoft has Azure Stack, which is kind of the same idea. Um, AWS is saying that, I guess they talked about EC2. Um, they talked about cloud formation templates and AMIs being available. They said that some of the other services like RDS and SageMaker will be supported. It's not clear when that will be is. Could take a yeah, while. I'd love to see how much of some of these cool new, you know, uh, Lambda services and runtimes are available mm. with Outpost as well. Because you know, quite naturally, me, like most SaaS companies, would love to be able to answer yes when certain customers ask to run your functionality on-prem. This offers a promise of that, and based on some of the answers to the detailed questions now or later, this could be game-changing in terms of really helping the whole entire SaaS industry penetrate deeper into the enterprise You know, on the back of AWS. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would argue you could already do that with the Greengrass. You can already run Lambda functions and several of the other capabilities, Greengrass on-premises, um, along with some of the capabilities that Snowball um, provides. And that was another announcement that was made. Um, I don't know if it was pre, uh, pre the conference or not, where the new specs of Snowball, which were pretty impressive. And that's another thing that you, you can run on premises along with, uh, along with green grass and the green grass stuff. Uh, people are running all sorts of Lambda functions and such already. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's cool. If I could see DynamoDB and S3 and obviously Lambda, as we've mentioned, and just a few basic EC2 instance types available on-prem with the same control flow and the same developer interfaces, that, that's a game changer, at least for, for my SaaS offering. So before we kind of run down the rest of the ML and AI announcements, uh, there are a few candidates for the wackiest new product or new offering or the, the most unexpected uh, Val, what's on that list for you? Well, I wouldn't call it wacky. I'd call it super geeky cool, which is Deep Racer. Right? <laughs> uh, I'll put you guys on the spot and say if you've pre-ordered yours already. I think I remember your answer, Sam. I'm not yep. sure about Dave. <laughs> I, I have not. Uh, I have not ordered that. Although I did. Um, I did order the Deep Lens when it was available and got that uh, and played with that quite a bit. Very cool. The other wacky thing, and it's, it belongs in the rumor mill, was that Amazon AWS were doing something with all the photos of the attendees that appear on the badges with regards to just, you know, propping up their own, you know, image image training training data sets oh, for their really? services. Yeah. But that's, huh. again, that's just a rumor I saw on Twitter that caught my attention. Okay. Okay. I would say wackiest for me is AWS Station. Yes. <laughs> And so that for, caught me off guard. <laughs> a fully managed ground station as a service for when you want to launch a satellite. That I was not seeing. I did not see that one coming at all. I can finally plan that trip to the Sahara Desert. Now. <laughs> they also announced uh, RoboMaker, which is this environment for like building robotics applications that I kind of, I mean, they did some stuff with, with, with Roz uh, last year, I think. Um, and so maybe this is an extension of that, but I, you know, they're doing like, it's a full robotics development environment. It's got simulation environment. They're doing fleet management. That's, that's one of the biggest things 
that I thought was exciting about that was the simulator, mm -hmm. uh, where you can where you can simulate uh, not only a single robot and and interfacing with that, but you can simulate that fleet of robots and how they will behave uh, with now, without needing all of that equipment. I think that's a game changer in and of itself uh, mm -hmm. for people doing uh, robotic projects. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's actually cool, but uh, ironically, I think that was a Tuesday announcement, right? So it, it, it almost got forgotten <laughs> as brought it up by me. I, I'd love to see again whether or not so much reference customers, but just see examples of how people are applying this even in small ways, you know, whether it's interestingly enough for, um, you know, robotic assembly and assembly lines, whether it's helping with logistics of shipping or, or other interesting applications, particularly ones where there's a lot of um, health hazards to humans and, and robots could, uh, could do those tasks much more safely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Speaking of early announcements that kind of got, you know, swept up and forgotten in the melee here, there was uh, an interesting announcement in what has now become known as pre uh, pre invent the you know all of the announcements <laughs> before reinvent. Uh, we've got a name for that now. So and as one of the pre invent announcements, they announced predictive scaling. Did anyone catch that? I think out of the side of my eye, but I never actually internalized it until you brought it up right now. That's <laughs> Was that tied to some of the, the automated tiering in S3 that they announced? Ah, so that's another interesting one. So uh, I don't know, you know, maybe kind of ideologically tied. Uh, well, definitely ideologically tied. And that's what's kind of interesting here. So predictive scaling is basically, I'm assuming it works, you know, in conjunction with like cloud formation and some of the other auto scaling mechanisms. But the idea is that they've got machine learning models now that are making predictive scaling decisions as opposed to uh, the operator having to define a set of rules around, you know, memory or CPU utilization or what have you. Uh, and so this is particularly interesting for folks that have applications that maybe have a long warm-up time uh, or uh, take a long time to, you know, stand up for whatever reason. Yeah, I was thinking, yeah, Lambda cold start, right? That sounds like an ideal application for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this... The uh, S3 thing, I forget what that one is called, but it's similar. Like they're going to be predictively uh, predictive tiering or something, like predictively staging data uh, across yes. these. Storage tiering is like a good decade, 15 year old technology that's been applied, you know, uh, particularly in the days of of high cache systems like the MC Symmetrics when it first came out and then in the in the area of flash now with memory tiers and flash and disk tiers. But they've always been fairly, you know, static models or very simplistic algorithms. Uh, and I think some people are trying to, you know, I, I remember, because it's not hopefully not confidential now, it's been more than 12 months at NetApp, we were definitely trying to do some more clever things with regards to on-tap caching, but this seems to take it to a whole other level because of obviously the resources available for both the training and the inference to apply, you know, the, the, the right decision to whichever data needs to move between tiers. So these two announcements collectively, for me, are a strong candidate for kind of a most exciting thing at reInvent. And it's the idea that that machine learning is is becoming part of the infrastructure, right? Part of the way that we're able to deliver, you know, scalable infra. So, you know, Jeff Dean, obviously Google does a lot of this and AWS does a lot of this stuff internally um, that we don't know so much about. Um, but uh, Jeff Dean at Google, for example, has been doing uh, talks on this for quite a while about how you know, we can use machine learning for a ton of things to make infrastructure more effective, like query optimization and cache exactly, optimization yeah. and, you know, predictive scaling and tiering. Uh, and I think this is just the beginning of um, of this wave. And that's one of my favorite topics, actually. You probably remember, I think the title of Jeff's paper was The Case for Learned Indexes. It was actually, you know, he co-authored it with a bunch of other researchers, but uh, it was fascinating that it ties into a blog Andre Carpathy from Tesla wrote around Software 2.0, 
and how you know in, incredibly valuable um, you know web properties such as the actual Google homepage, the search page, is anywhere between fifteen to twenty percent machine generated code now, no longer human generated code. And uh, you know, more to Jeff's point, you're able to take a lot of these low-level routines, be they storage or compute resource management, index management, and so forth, and be better at it with thousands of instances of machine inference versus just a few smart DBAs or or you know other content managers. And and that's an, an interesting but also potentially disturbing trend if it's not managed carefully. So I'm going to run down these announcements and just jump in if you've got. Uh, if it strikes you as interesting or you've got anything uh, you want to chime in on. So we talked about SageMaker Ground Truth, SageMaker Reinforcement Learning, uh, Deep Racer, mine is on order, Val's is on order. Uh, I, I wonder, well, by the time by the time this podcast is published, it will be more expensive. There is a special on these things during reInvent. Uh, so I tweeted about it. Hopefully you saw that uh, if you're interested uh, EC2 P3 DN instances. One of you guys referred to this earlier. Yes. Yes. Uh, so this is the, the AWS's largest compute instance, uh, P3, but with now 100 gig networking, NVIDIA V100, 32 gigs per GPU, Skylake uh, vCPUs with the AVX 512 instruction set. That yeah, sounds like the mother of all instances. <laughs> for for today, for this week. <laughs> yeah. It's a massive amount of compute power in an instance type that you can spin up on demand. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's it all comes back to the ability to rent a supercomputer, right? For as little time as you need. That's just the amazing one of the amazing attributes of cloud overall. So we talked about elastic inference. Uh we did not talk about uh, another interesting announcement, AWS Inferentia. Anyone uh, catch that one? I did not. What is that? Yeah, me neither. AWS Inferentia is their forthcoming high-performance uh, machine learning chip. So this is oh. a product of their acquisition of Annapurna Labs. Uh, it is slated to come out next year. It is... Uh, Inference, I believe. Well, Inferentia is focused on inference. <laughs> right, right. Uh, and it's uh, each of these chips will do hundreds of tensor operations per second. And you can cluster these chips uh, to scale that to the thousands. And so it, the, there's kind of this interesting one-two punch between elastic inference, which is, I think this is GA now, right? Um, yeah. And inferentia, uh, so elastic inference is going to promises to lower inference costs by up to 75%. Inferentia, when it comes online, they're saying offers further reduction of cost by 10x. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, so this actually corresponds to two related announcements this week. One was obviously support for, I don't know, initially or just more ARM instance types. And the other one that wasn't an Amazon announcement, but just happened the same week, was the Risk Five announcement by the Linux Foundation, and some of the potential opportunities that offers people like Amazon to offer really interesting customized chipsets like this for almost any high volume application with a 10x impact. Mm. Interesting, interesting. And so, you know, clearly AWS is not alone in chasing down this custom inference chip, custom inference hardware. We talked about the uh, Google TPU. Uh, Microsoft, is theirs Brainwave or is that something different? Yeah, I know they've had, was it either, certainly custom FPGAs with Azure, but maybe even some some custom ASICs. But am I the only one now that starts to feel like this is you know mainframe era all over again with everyone running completely custom hardware and some thin shim of compatibility maybe at the container level between between the clouds themselves? Well, uh, or the, the model compiler level, a la SageMaker right. Neo. Wait, yeah. wait, are we saying that AWS is becoming IBM? That's what's <laughs> all of them are actually, <laughs> except for maybe IBM. Ironically, <laughs> not sure what they're doing with power, but yeah. I was talking to someone, and we were saying that uh, AWS uh, was becoming more like an IBM uh, and Microsoft uh, of the '90s, 
um, and that uh, and that we were seeing. I, I think we said Microsoft was behaving more like uh, like Apple. Apple was behaving. Um, who was Apple behaving? Apple was behaving more like um, Oracle. <laughs> oh, Dell. Okay, Dell in the nineties. Uh, I lived through those eras of you know Microsoft could kill an industry with a pre, you know pre-announced press release. And it does seem like Amazon, particularly AWS, you know, has that power now in the tech industry to just announce or pre-announce something and freeze like an entire new market segment. Mm-hmm. I mean, I th- if you look at Outpost, I wouldn't be looking to buy hardware to uh, to build my new VMware or uh, or a competitive cloud thing until I was able to see what they were going to offer and what the cost structure and such looked like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, at a macro level, you can probably start the countdown clock as to how many, you know, more hardware refresh cycles there will be for people if, as you say, Dave, if, you know, the specs and the price performance, you know, match up to expectations. The machine learning offerings that we ran through are kind of under the broad category of new stuff. Uh, and then there's more like improvements and incremental stuff and tools. Uh, and there are a bunch of those as well. Uh, so one of those was... They announced earlier in the week a marketplace for machine learning. So kind of like an ML app store. Did anyone uh, that catch your your eye, Val? I absolutely caught my eye. You know, I noticed, of course, they weren't the first to do this, but just the fact that in combination, you know, with an integrated workflow for a data scientist and all the other cool tools that are either maturing, which, you know, I think the, the maturing of all these services announced in prior years might be the unsung hero of these of these announcements because they're really usable now and very functional. But the fact that now you have this kind of marketplace also available on AWS is, you know, with partners as well as natively from from the rest of Amazon is very, very cool. And if they do share some of the models they use on the proper Amazon, you know, retail side, then that could also be a game changer with regards to, you know, e-commerce everywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one of the things that I thought was interesting about this, if I'm not mixing it up with another announcement, is that it's all based on like when I first heard it described, I thought, okay, well, how is this different from like labeling a an AMI as machine learning? But this is all based on containers. Yeah, I, I forgot that detail, but yeah, so that, that makes it a bit more granular for sure. Yeah, uh, so. It's interesting. Like it's based on containers. They they they've got some ability to you know like the like the partner AMIs. You can monetize them, uh, and they've got folks like Figure Eight and Deep Vision, H two O, Tibco, uh, and some others that are kind of already part of this this new ecosystem. And yeah, how is this going to tie into the comments you made earlier in the podcast around transfer learning and? Uh... The ability now to just buy a model, you know, maybe tweak it or not, and just apply it to some other thing and, and be super productive much earlier on in a in a data science cycle. I, I mean, I think I think that's where this heads. I think uh, the the interesting thing will be um, to me: can they evolve it where I can see what the specific specs of the performance of this model are and compare similar models? and look at the performance and accuracy that they offer and decide which one is best for me. And at that point, um, there's not that much incentive for me to go out and build my own model from scratch. Because- or how about how about a recommendation engine for what you just described, Dave? <laughs> of course. <laughs> I'm like slowly wrapping my head around what this is. And I, I've talked to um, some folks at AWS about this yesterday. I think the thing that caught me up is that the the folks that they are, you know, rolling out as partners like Tibco and Figure Eight, I think of them as like application and tools and platform vendors. And so I think that these are like entire systems that, you know, we could already put those in AMIs and spin them up. And so what's the big deal? But you know, the the, I guess the reason why this container thing is important, you know, going back to what was clear to you and is sinking in for me is that, you know, those are just companies that are publishing into a, a model marketplace and, and, and repository that you can access from, you know, SageMaker as opposed to like spinning up some new product or some, spinning up some whole product on an, in an instance. It's brokering algorithms. 
Yeah, so there are folks that play in this space. Algorithmia is one uh, company who I've got a lot of respect for. They're doing really interesting things. It'd be interesting to see, you know, how this plays out for them. So the next set of announcements are, I think, all around these, like the highest tier and the the ML stack, these cognitive APIs or these uh, AI as a service APIs. And uh, there are a couple of these that I found really interesting. So they uh, there's one that's called Personalize. And the idea is that it is a, a recommendation system, uh, kind of as a service, recommendations as a service. And then there's one that's called Forecast, and that is forecasting as a service. And you know, their pitch for this is that recommendations and forecasts are both, forecasting are both these examples of things that are really hard to do generically, like your product catalog and data sources, you know, whether it's clickstream or logs or whatever, that's very customized to, to you. Uh, and likewise, things that you need to forecast are very customized to you. And so it's very difficult to, off, to offer just a generic personalization API or forecasting API. But, uh, and this is what's really interesting, and, and they didn't explain it like this, but it, it was kind of a light bulb as soon as they said it for me. Right? What they've really done with these is like, it's an application level version of AutoML. Like, so what you know Google did with AutoML is like, it's a machine learning thing, right? You... Yeah. Uh, give it a bunch of images and, and you know, they're going to do architecture search and optimization to give you uh, to, to give you a better, you know, image labeling API. Uh, but this is that same idea. You're giving it your data and it's going to do architecture search and data cleansing and like a whole set of steps that is doing is basically doing auto ML for you, but at an at, at a much higher level, at an application or, or really a business level, which is really cool. Yeah, I agree. I would love to try this, you know, with, with very common businesses that have to forecast, you know, how much supply they're going to buy, forecast what kind of staff they're going to need to manufacture or assemble something, forecast what kind of shipping they're going to have to reserve ahead of time, forecast how long it's going to take for customers to pay them. And, you know, is that going to be quicker than when the payments they have to make to their suppliers? This can impact literally almost every aspect of a business. And uh, it, it's going to be exciting to see what people do with it next year and year after that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I pulled up my list of the things that they're doing. So they're, they're loading your data, they're inspecting your data, they're identifying features, they're selecting algorithms, they're selecting hyperparameters, they're training and optimizing models, they're building a feature store, they're deploying and hosting these models, or so serving them up for you, and they're caching. They're creating real-time caches, so they're doing all of this stuff, you know, specific to your data. That is pretty cool. Yeah. So a couple of other services uh, that they announced: Com Comprehend Medical. So Comprehend is their like text extraction uh, service, uh, and Comprehend Medical is uh, a vertical medical, obviously, oriented version of that. Uh, and then another one that I think is kind of the, maybe like the the low-key, super high utility, you know, not sexy announcement of this whole, you know, of all of, all of these is a new one called Textract. And it's basically a souped up OCR system that you give it a PDF uh, or, you know, they say almost any document and it'll extract the, the text and data from that document, but it does it in a way that's like, if there are tables in that document, it will extract those tables. If there are, um, you know, you know, kind of lists, you know, key, it'll extract key value pairs. It, I heard someone say this, it wasn't in the, uh, any of the slides I saw, but like it, it sounds like it will retain some of the structure of the documents. It'll deliver bounding boxes for where, you know, document features are like tables and stuff like that. Uh, and you don't need to know any machine learning to do any of that stuff. 
uh, I could see, I can envision, uh, you know, whole businesses kind of just built on kind of commercializing this service. Yeah, like I remember still having PTSD from doing expenses at NetApp with like an antiquated 1990s Oracle like expense system. And so this could revolutionize that, right? If you have Expensify or Concur, integrate this hopefully very quickly. It could just increase productivity and employee morale so much just for expense reporting alone. I, I was curious how that would work. You would um, upload receipt images and have it yeah. generate the expense report? Exactly. Zero touch almost. The use case that they gave for this was uh, tax forms. Like, you know, there's one canonical uh, W-9 form, but there are, you know, hundreds of different kind of versions of W-9 forms. Like as long as you capture the information and the lines, you could come up with your own custom version of that form. And apparently everyone has. And so automating pulling, extracting the data from those forms into a, a form that you can then dump into a database is difficult because you have all these variants of these, these forms. Um, you know, or if you think of like invoices, you know, it's, it's structured or semi-structured if you prefer data, right? It's not a picture. It's not a bunch of text, but OCR just treats it, you know, it starts with a picture and gets out a bunch of text, but it loses all of the semantic meaning in these forms. And so what text, text extract is meant to do is to preserve all of that using, of course, machine learning, uh, which is pretty so I, cool. I, I see text, but the bigger one that I see would be medical. Yeah. I Talk about that. That's huge. Uh, think about all of the medical forms, things that you would submit uh, to insurance, um, uh, all of that. If if you're if you were a hospital or medical um, uh, medical group and you deal with submitting to different insurance companies, um, I see lots and lots of applicability for that. Um, let alone the myriad of different, as you pointed out, uh, tax forms and such. I would see that as big. The other thing that would be big uh, would be legal um, and maintaining the forms. Um, uh, because a lot of different legal documents that you file with courts and such also follow a standardized format for that court or maybe even for that state, depending, but at least for, uh, say, that specific um, uh, county, but it will change for others. But they, but all of those documents for that specific court um, will follow the same format, at least for long periods of time, say decades. Uh, so, uh, being able to maintain that would also be huge. Um, but those are just a few examples that come to mind that are very, very large, have broad applicability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the semantic processing of images is one thing. I'm wondering how they'll be able to extend this to you know other other localized languages, so to speak. Because you know, I, I just came back from some trips to China, and that massive Belt and Road Initiative they have touches so many countries and so many cultures and languages and 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 written written characters and scripts that as this matures, this could be another game changer for how you process that kind of very heterogeneous supply chain. Yeah. So it's, it, it, it the, your comment about medical does raise an interesting question about the relationship between the new comprehend medical offering and Textract. And do they already, you know, talk to one another? Does Textract use Comprehend Medical for that very domain-specific thing, or can you do that? Or is that something that's coming in the future? Uh, interesting stuff there. Uh, so I think we made it through the ML-related stuff, amazingly, uh, in an hour. Um, but there's a bunch more stuff. Does anyone have, or do you guys have, like, your favorite thing that we haven't talked about yet? We covered a lot. I think there's a whole bunch of, uh, as we talked earlier, maturing security offerings just for better overall governance and supervision of the various policies you have and the monitoring tools and, and the, the, the probably endless dashboards now that are available to you in terms of monitoring activity. So the whole notion of just a, a maturity overall of, of security and compliance tools and tool sets for AWS customers is, is one of those unsung heroic set of announcements this year for me as well. Mm -hmm. How about you, Dave? I don't know. I, I think for me, the I think the biggest thing is the absolute number of 
deeply innovative announcements with lots of meat behind them, um, lots and lots of things um, in the ML and the infrastructure space, uh, both. And it makes me wonder if it's not time for them to um, to change the conference. I think that we're at the point where there are too many announcements. Um, <laughs> the, the topics are too broad. They cover too much. And the conference itself, it's not possible to go if you have a, a an interest that spreads even a couple of these for you to successfully go and attend the workshops and sessions. And so when a conference reaches that, um, it's usually time for the conference to split out into more um, uh, separate conferences that cover each of those kind of domains. And I think reInvent is at that point. That's That's my mm-hmm. opinion. As an attendee, I would say I agree with Dave, right? I'm not sure if if, if uh, you're a presenter or, or you know exhibitor or or actually the one that hosts the conference that the economies of scale would be attractive. But as an attendee, I couldn't agree more with Dave. And I think moreover, we noticed earlier on that there's more and more pre-announcements happening because you can only squeeze in you know one keynote a year for for major announcements and spreading the conferences out, you know, both location wise, venue wise, chronologically would let them announce, I think, more timely availability of these cool new services that they keep announcing. I also have a meta comment, uh, but I'm going to hold that for one second because I do have one more product announcement that I'm really excited about. (laughs) And it's kind of like adjacent to machine learning stuff. Uh, Did you catch the lake formation announcement? Yes, yes. Lake formation is pretty cool. So... I guess the the meta to lake formation is that AWS this year, I think for the first time, has been super aggressive about positioning S3 as a data lake. I have not heard them talk about it like that before. Uh, And so lake formation is this new offering that basically automates the data pipeline for getting data into uh, S3. So you're talking about like crawling your on-premises data stores and uh, cataloging and cleansing data, getting it into S3, organizing it, uh, deduplication, uh, and you know it can crawl uh, you know relational databases as well as you know semi-structured. Uh, and, and unstructured data sources. Uh, you know, when I think about and, and talk to folks about like the path to kind of repeatable enterprise machine learning, like the, you know, the stumbling block for a lot of people, like, you know, kind of stuck in the blocks is, you know, having a centralized data repository, whether you call it a data warehouse or it is a data warehouse or a data lake or a fabric or whatever. Like it's a big deal, uh, and it's cool to see them taking that on. Yeah, in fact, not only that, but you know, I think they buried the lead a little bit with Lake Formation and that this can revolutionize things like GDPR and other kinds of privacy compliance efforts where the discovery part of this alone, particularly as more and more data is either managed you know, in conjunction with Outpost, both on-prem and off-prem, uh, the discovery part and then the cataloging part is that matures and you can automatically categorize data and create, you know, automated master data models. And then you can do all sorts of interesting recommendation engines based on that. Mm. When you tie some of those workflows together, that is really revolutionary in this uh, world of compliance and spending a lot of time in. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. I think a lot of, uh, I think a lot of people have been using um, S3 as kind of their mini data lake, so to speak. They'll dump as much as they can in, but they're still kind of limited in, in their options um, with what they can do and and how it works, although they keep expanding S3's functionality uh, constantly, I, I still think uh, I still think this taking on the data lake, um, especially for the impact it has with um, analysis and machine learning, uh, is a big deal. It really mm-hmm. is. That that's true. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so my my meta comment that I was saving was, you know, one of the things that you know they've taken some some steps towards addressing with their 
Oh, they also announced like a whole ML training and certification curriculum, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> uh, but, oh, that. Uh, oh, that. Right. Exactly. But, you know, and, and they, they'd previously announced like ML partner competencies. Uh, but one of the things that struck me in going into the expo, which is massive, like several hundred exhibiting companies in the, in the expo, very few of them, even at this stage, you know, are ML and AI related. Like a lot of them have, uh, do other things and are kind of, you know, have their ML and AI story, you know, they're as vendors, you know, do, tech vendors do. But in terms of kind of pure play, ML and AI partners, you know, whether services or product, ISVs, software as a service, the, the pickings were relatively slim. And it, it, it kind of brought to mind a question that I started kind of asking myself last year, which is like, does AWS have an ecosystem problem around machine learning? Like, is it not, you know, open enough or inclusive enough or, you know, something that they, they're not able to kind of catalyze partners to, to get on board or, or make it worth their while? Or is it just too early? This is something I noticed actually about the machine learning, you know, industry and market segment as a whole is by and large, very few of those companies, if any, grow up to be big independent successes. And, you know, consequently, there's just a lot of acquiring going on. So I don't know if these companies reach a stage where they can actually get enough capital to have a branding style of marketing campaign that capital intensive companies like the storage companies, my confirmation bias goes to. I noticed so many, <laughs> you know, noticed so many giant, you know, storage, you know, logos and branding on the Miracle Mile screen, you know, across from the Aria and the Cosmo. And mm -hmm. I just saw a lot of marketing and branding dollars going, you know, from infrastructure companies. But to your point, not so much from a lot of the smaller innovative companies and in spaces like ML. Mm. Uh, interesting take for sure. I think that just speaks more to my point about splitting the conference uh, into smaller conferences. Right, right. If you're a ML or AI pure play company, like the the hit rate here, the, the signal to noise ratio has got to be pretty low still. Yeah, unfortunately. Uh, I could get with that, Dave. Uh, Me too. Just, just, so let's start a just movement right here, right now. Don't make it any later in the year. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, Agreed. Um, I, you know, I think we should. Uh, I think we should reach out uh, to Werner and uh, and and Andy Jassy and tell them uh, that. <laughs> awesome. Well, guys, I've got to pack up and bolt to the airport. Uh, but it was awesome recapping, uh, reinvent with you guys. Thanks so much for uh, hopping on with me. I had a great Thank time. You. Thanks for including me this year. And yeah, to Dave's point, maybe we'll have you know, more mini recaps going forward when they split up these conferences. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Awesome. Take care, guys. Bye, Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, everyone. That's our show for today. For more information on Dave, Val, or any of the topics covered in this episode, visit twimlai.com slash talk slash 205. If you're a fan of the show and you haven't already done so, or if you're a new listener and you like what you hear, visit your Apple or Google podcast app and leave us a five-star rating and review. Your reviews help inspire us to create more and better content, and they help new listeners find the show. As always, thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.